Hi, uh, my name is Doug Lynch. I'm a scientist here at Lycor Biosciences, and this video will give a brief introduction to making a basic survey measurement with the LI6800. Um, so for today's demo, we have the fluorometer chamber on board. Um, so some quick um, important considerations to make when setting up for a survey measurement uh, in include um, thinking about the environment that your plant has been experiencing prior to clamping. And the most important variable typically to consider is the light environment. So the LI6800 sensor head has a uh, quantum sensor here, the LI190R, that's external to the chamber uh, that can be used to measure the light intensity incident on the leaves that you're about to measure. And so uh, good practice would be to um, you know, line up your sensor head prior to clamping on your leaves with that sensor in the plane of the leaf you're going to measure and get an idea of the light intensity your leaves are experiencing. Then you can set up the sensor head, light, uh, the, the light source, to match that light intensity. Uh, so it's really important because obviously photosynthesis is driven largely by light intensity. And if you clamp on a leaf with a greatly different light intensity than that leaf has experienced, uh, your leaf will not reach steady state for many minutes. And uh, that can lead to either poor data or um, long times waiting for that acclimation period and you'll get fewer data points. So matching the light intensity is, is typically the best procedure for a survey measurement. And um, just, to, just to, to reiterate the importance of that, the leaf angle will matter. So if the, if the leaf is at some sort of steep angle with respect to the sun and you hold that sensor at a different angle, uh, that won't represent the light intensity that life is experiencing, or that leaf is experiencing. So you, you want to match both the location and the angle of your leaf when measuring that light. Um, so that's something to do prior to clamping on your leaf. And we'll talk about some other considerations when we show uh, setting up the environmental controls here in a minute. Um, but uh, just to, to briefly show clamping on a leaf, um, I'm already clamped, but I'm going to go ahead and, and unclamp. And then once I've got my conditions set up that I'm about to show in a minute to make a measurement, it's as simple as putting the leaf in your cuvette and uh, pushing down the handle. Okay, so we're going to walk through uh, some typical environmental control setups to make a basic survey measurement. And you can see in the environment tab, all the environmental controls are sub-tabs within that tab, and we're just going to start at the top and, and work our way down. Um, and so the first thing we'll want to choose is a flow rate to our sample cuvette. And for a survey measurement, um, we would typically recommend being on the higher end of the, the flow rates, uh, and that will act to flush the chamber more quickly, since you're going to be repeatedly opening and closing the chamber, uh, the faster you can flush that sample volume, uh, the more quickly your measurement will go. And so with the fluorometer chamber, uh, on the higher end of, of typical flow rates is about 700. So that's what I would choose. And you set that with this box here. I already had it set, but I'll just go ahead and reset that flow rate. Now, if you're working with um, leaves that have very low assimilation rates or maybe measuring dark respiration, you may want to consider a lower flow rate, which uh, will give you a little bit better signal to noise ratio um, on that delta CO2, um, but it will take a few seconds longer to flush. And that's going to be a, a constant trade-off with a lot of our environmental controls that we'll choose. Next is uh, H2O. And here your choices are, um, as I've chosen, to set up the relative humidity in the sample cuvette. Uh, you could also set uh, the uh, mole fraction on your reference or the mole fraction in your chamber uh, alternatively, or you can set on the VPD. Um, for my experience, a good compromise with this instrument is to, to choose to control on the relative humidity. Uh, so that will be constant throughout your measurements. Um, it, again, it is a slightly longer uh, time for the control loop to reach stability than if you were controlling on the reference. 
because every time you close that chamber and the conditions have changed, the control loop has to, to re-engage to hit that set point. Um, but it will provide less noise in your data because you're guaranteeing that relative humidity is constant for all of your measurements. And again, you, you uh, set those by tapping on the variable you want to change and then picking a, a set point. And you'll also see when the set point I'm choosing hits its mark and is, a, is happy at the set point you've chosen, uh, you'll see this green circle telling you that. And that's also visible down the left-hand column over here. And up top, so if you're on a different screen, you can see of the control loops you have working, how many of them have hit their set point. And in my case, all seven have hit their set point. Another important consideration is your CO2 concentration. Typically, you'll work around ambient, so around 400 ppm. Uh, and again, a choice is to control on the reference, so on the incoming airstream or on the sample. Uh, again, if you ch control on the sample, CO2 sample, uh, it will take a few seconds longer to reach stability once you've closed that chamber, but you'll be guaranteeing the same concentration around your leaf for every single measurement. Um, and so this is, uh, again, a choice to make. Uh, another common choice that can give you both uh, faster measurements is to, to clamp on a representative leaf like I've done here and note that my delta CO2 is about 5 ppm in my case. And so I can control on reference at 5 ppm above that ambient concentration, so about the delta I'm expecting. And now my CO2 sample will be right around 400, which is what that leaf uh, was experiencing prior to me clamping on it. So those are the, the choices for this control loop. Fan speed, this controls the boundary layer conductance, which we want to be as high as possible for a better estimate of stomatal conductance. And uh, a typical choice is about 10,000 RPM, which will st really strip that boundary layer. Temperature control loops have an additional trade-off in terms of battery life. Uh, the, the, the harder you're gonna make your temperature controller work, the more quickly you'll drain your batteries. Uh, these batteries do have quite a good lifetime and so uh, controlling on temperature is typically a good idea, again, depending on the material you're working with um, and how sensitive to temperature they are. You do have a couple choices for which temperature to control. Uh, you can control the heat exchanger, which is further away from the leaf, but is not impacted by opening and closing the chamber. And that's typically a good idea because the temperature control loops uh, tend to take a while. Uh, uh, adjusting the temperature in that chamber is relatively slow compared to the other control loops. Um, and controlling that heat exchanger will give a relatively consistent leaf temperature um, while not uh, uh, slowing down your measurements. But to be really precise, you could control the air temperature in the chamber or the leaf temperature as well. The light environment, as I mentioned, I have the fluorometer on my chamber and I'm going to pick a set point that's probably very close to uh, what I measured prior to clamping on these leaves or measure kind of the uh, uh, average light environment of my cohort of leaves I wish to measure. And that's what I'll choose for my set point. Um, you also can choose the red blue mix. Um, a, a, most common approach is to use mostly red light with a little bit of blue, about 10%, uh, to help keep the stomates open. Um, for a survey measurement, that's probably not um, a requirement, but that is a, a sort of a typical setting. If you also want to measure fluorescence, you would want to make sure uh, your measuring beam is turned on and the, the, the sort of standard modulation rates are a good starting point. And then you would want to set up the type of flash you wish to give. Here I'll give a rectangular flash. And um, a, a good starting point for making measurements is to look at maybe uh, an 8,000 micromole per meter squared per second flash at about one second long. Uh, these are all parameters that would need to be explored um, to see their impacts on, on your plant material. So now I've got all my environmental controls set up. Um, a few things you'd want to do before making measurements include um, you know, running your warm-up tests prior to even getting to this point, making sure the instrument's performing well. 
and um, to log data you absolutely need a log file open so we're going to go ahead over here to the log files screen you would want to select your logging options um, i'm going to log to my excel file um, you definitely need to match periodically while making survey measurements and uh, i like to use the uh, conditional match so i'm not matching every time i log a data point which would slow me down uh, but I'm only going to match if I meet one of these uh, uh, criteria. And again, there's some choices that can be made, but the, the defaults are pretty reasonable there. You would want to decide if you want to give a saturating flash and make a fluorescence measurement along with each measurement. I'm going to go ahead and do that here. And you want to open up your log file. Again, this, is, this naming convention is, is up to you, and you can create subfolders for different projects, which can be quite nice. And I'm just going to make a survey test folder to log my data to. Now I've got all my environmental controls set up. I've got a log file open and I'm ready to log data. And I can come to my measurement screen and, um, and see if, if I'm stable and ready to log a data point. And you can see that by watching some of the graphs. You can look at the variables over here on the grid. Um, so this is a pretty tight, tight constraint on assimilation as well as conductance. This leaf is fairly stable. Uh, I would say that's probably ready to log a data point. Um, you'll see up here that where, where you log a data point is you push this button here, or there's a button on the sensor head you can press, and it gives you information on whether it's going to match or not with this data point. And in this case, it is. And I would just press my log button. And it's going to go ahead and give that flash and log the data point. And in this case, because of that match requirement, it's going to go ahead and, and automatically match my analyzers. And then once that's done, that will uh, increment the number of data points to one. And it will go back to sort of normal mode. And this is where I can unclamp and move to my next leaf. And let's look what that looks like real quick. So I can unclamp. And then I can move to the next leaf and reclamp. And this can help you. Um, now you'll see as that chamber is flushed, you can kind of look at some of your other graphs. For example, you can watch the CO2 concentrations. And you can see my CO2 reference, which I'm controlling on, didn't change at all. But when I opened my chamber, there was a big rush of CO2 from this room that I'm in where the concentration is higher. And now as that chamber flushes, I'm getting closer and closer to stability. And you can decide to log um, based on a number. You can watch these graphs and see when things look stable. You can use um, stability criteria, which can be very helpful, and objectively decide when the slope or rate of change of these variables, whichever variables you find most useful, um, gets below a threshold. You can use that to log. Um, so a lot of people will look at CO2 graphs, or again, you can watch the graph of assimilation. And you can see that uh, in this purple line here is now rest stable, and I would be ready to log that data point. Thank you for watching uh, this video. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, you can feel free to contact your local distributor or Litecore directly, or visit our website uh, for much more detailed information on the LI6800.